So, welcome to this introduction into uh, an overview of the history of the computer vision techniques. Uh, the, uh, we are not aiming at giving you any kind of uh, uh, technical depth in any one of the techniques we'll see in this presentation, but uh, giving you uh, the uh, overall timeline of uh, between uh, the uh, pioneering work in uh, computer vision uh, after uh, World War II and uh, the uh, recent boom in AI. Uh, that will help with giving you a bit more perspective and uh, uh, also uh, in line with what we'll see later during the school, uh, some elements uh, that will have you think about uh, what is implied uh, with this uh, recent boom in AI and um, in particular uh, with respect to the uh, ethical concerns. So, so we'll first uh, talk about uh, a, a kind of a pattern, uh, a pattern that repeats itself uh, during the history of AI. Uh, uh, that is basically an alternance of high expectations and disappointments. Uh, that will be uh, the uh, first part of our presentation. And then we'll focus more on what is really uh, uh, the um, uh, object of the school. We'll focus on convolutional, convolutional networks uh, from the early developments uh, in the mostly in the 80s, uh, up uh, to uh, the uh, their uh, widespread uh, application uh, in uh, the last decade, and uh, then uh, we'll see what actually conditioned uh, the recent uh, AI craze. Uh, which factors were actually instrumental in allowing uh, the uh, uh, dissemination as well as uh, the uh, wide use of those techniques uh, uh, by um, uh, laymen uh, uh, and not only computer scientists working in academia or in uh, uh, labs. So. So, let's start with the uh, first topic, so the I and lows of AI. And uh, AI has a long history of being uh, the next big thing. Uh, and uh, this, uh, we would observe here is that uh, uh, there are uh, typically periods where there is a uh, uh, AI is all the hype, and then it's followed by uh, what we call a, a winter. Uh, a winter where actually uh, AI doesn't live up to ex the expectations. And uh, basically there are two winters in the AI story. The first one is uh, at the beginning of 70s, and the second one is uh, uh, at the end of the 80s. And we look, uh, we'll have a closer look in particular uh, at uh, the first iteration of uh, this um, uh, cycle of high expectations and disappointments. So, um, in the early 70s, uh, that's uh, the time where uh, the first connected system, uh, which was called the Perceptron, disappoints. And uh, after that, uh, interest shifts to uh, symbolical, knowledge-based approach to AI. Uh, and the second winter uh, matches the demise of the least market, what could be summarized as the uh, expert systems uh, based on uh, this functional language that was called LISP. And, uh, but 
interestingly, uh, if we look at uh, this second winter where uh, a number of uh, company, uh, companies do not uh, survive uh, the uh, uh, overhyping of um, uh, AI, uh, we can see that uh, winters are usually largely overstated. So we can see that some systems uh, that uh, were born in that time uh, were good enough for their specific task and uh, they survived actually mostly in big companies. Uh, and after that uh, did not prevent uh, people in academia to explore quietly new directions, even if they did not have a lot of money, which was a problem and clearly uh, slowed the pace of progress. Uh, but uh, we'll see that in the uh, uh, years that follow, uh, people were uh, already able to uh, build the milestones of what we would call uh, the uh, first really functional neural networks. So, but before we turn to neural networks, let's take a moment to have a closer look at the perceptron moment. So, so the perceptron. So it's uh, by Rosenblatt in '58, and uh, the idea here is that uh, inspired by the organization of the biological brain, and uh, we'll see that uh, whether uh, this model is uh, exact or not uh, actually doesn't matter a lot. Uh, uh, Rosenblatt uh, will actually build a, 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 a system of connections that will uh, uh, use sensory points that will take an input source and then will project those points uh, into another layer and uh, uh, providing then uh, feedback circuits in order to be able to modify those connections afterwards with a function that will actually uh, 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 aggregate some of those signals into response units. So that was somehow uh, uh, an approximation of the way the brain would work. And the perceptron would basically try to replicate that by having uh, 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 a computer uh, take some inputs in different parts of a source image and through a parallel computing of those uh, input sources would actually uh, aggregate them uh, through a functions that would try then to uh, classify objects and in this particular case characters, printed characters. Now, uh, the perception uh, did not uh, live up to the expectations and uh, because mostly it was a, a way to linearly separate uh, uh, between objects. And uh, if you do a linear separation, what you can do is only draw a line between different points. But what, for example, if you want uh, to discriminate a region with two lines? And actually the model was not sophisticated enough yet, for example, to uh, be able to uh, uh, solve uh, uh, what should be normally looks like a straightforward problem, but what we call the XOR problem. So uh, if you've got uh, uh, points that you try to uh, distinguish logically here uh, between uh, four possible values, uh, XOR uh, should normally separate uh, in this case of a square, uh, uh, the two points on uh, the down diagonal here from the other two. But you cannot do that uh, through a single line. So uh, it's 
This was actually, uh, this problem was raised by Minsky in a, a later critique of uh, the perceptron. And uh, uh, for many people, that was it. Well, uh, this was a good idea. Maybe uh, it looks, looked like a good idea, but there is not a lot we can do with that. So let's forget about the perceptron. Let's forget about the connectionist uh, arch uh, architectures. And uh, actually, uh, Minsky's paper and later book was more, uh, was not a death sentence. It was a call for action. And, uh, but that did not prevent the connectionist paradigm to uh, fade uh, afterwards. And it, uh, what uh, it illustrates nonetheless uh, is basically uh, the fact that uh, the computer vision research has two uh, aspects. Uh, there is the side of the engineering feats where we build things that work, and there is the side of the uh, conceptual proofs, where not only we do things that work, but we show why they work. And uh, we'll see that sometimes uh, 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 we've got a good theoretical idea that are hard to support in real life. We'll see which factors uh, play in that case. And sometimes we also have engineering feats that uh, produce really interesting results. But uh, we are having a hard time explaining why those results are useful to us. So, and certainly, uh, Minsky could not foresee uh, what will appear uh, decades later, which is uh, AlexNet. So I just provide AlexNet here, uh, uh, a, a deep neural network as a, a, a visual counterpart of the uh, perception, uh, uh, because this uh, will put things into perspective and we see what are the steps between the perception and uh, AlexNet. Uh, this neural network was used to win uh, uh, the ImageNet uh, large-scale visual recognition challenge uh, by a wide, wide margin. So uh, the goal was to uh, sort uh, more than one million uh, three-channel images. And uh, AlexNet uh, had no real competitor uh, when it won, won that competition. And the AI boom of the last 10 years actually uh, has been building over that milestone. Now we can now maybe ask the question, uh, is the next AI winter around the corner or not? Uh, there is no way to tell yet. So uh, Another way to put things in per to perspective is to look at how much how much computing power you need in order to build your networks over time. And we see that uh, AI systems uh, from basically the 60s to the early uh, 2010s, AI systems uh, uh, have computing needs that basically follow uh, the well-known uh, Moore law where Basically, you have uh, the computing power uh, doubling every two years. But uh, clearly, something changes uh, at the beginning of uh, the last decade. So, uh, shortly after 2010, uh, clearly, uh, uh, all new networks and new architectures uh, uh, have uh, computing needs uh, that are actually uh, are using uh, uh, computing power that is uh, clearly uh, not commensurate with uh, what had been used before. We'll see what's behind that. So Now, this gives you, after giving you this kind of a uh, uh, long trend uh, view of the uh, AI history, uh, let's focus now on uh, the convolutional networks, which are uh, 
uh, clearly uh, what uh, uh, which are uh, clearly are the most useful tool we can use for uh, computer vision. So uh, the biological model uh, is uh, at uh, the beginning of uh, the first connectionist architecture. So, and in particular, uh, a well-known article in the Journal of Physiology by uh, Hubble and uh, Weasel uh, uh, tries to uh, model uh, uh, the way a, a cat uh, will process uh, visual signals. And uh, the hypothesis made by uh, Hubble was that actually uh, you had two layers of cells. The first layer is made of simple cells that capture uh, very elementary features. And then you had a, a second layer of cells that, will, uh, uh, that would actually aggregate those very simple features into more complex features. And these more complex, higher level cells will synthesize composite patterns. So that was the idea of Hubo. And uh, this uh, is uh, the key idea uh, that will allow connectionist architectures to go beyond the perception idea, where you did not have this idea of uh, uh, complex higher level cells that would uh, 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 transform uh, a collection of separate inputs into uh, another collection of inputs that, that would actually capture more information. So Now, let's actually get this biological model out of the way, <laughs> because uh, uh, as far as the cat is concerned or the brain is concerned, uh, Hubble's model has been revised considerably in the following decades. And uh, it has been a widely influential model. Uh, it has been a, a template for most connected systems in the following 50 years. However, uh, we can say that from that point on, uh, computer vision research, uh, by and large, uh, followed a, a track of its own. And uh, uh, certainly some people, in particular uh, in uh, departments of uh, neurobiology, uh, keep, uh, I mean, kept uh, trying to establish uh, uh, connections between what was happening in the biology and what was happening in computer science. But we're talking really uh, about a minority of people here. And most of the development we've seen in AI in the last decades are not strictly related to what has happened in biology. So, and um, one of the first to really take advantage of uh, this particular modelization is uh, Fukushima. So uh, roughly between 75 and 85, uh, Fukushima has been designed and refined uh, a, a two-tier system uh, that would uh, associate different layers. Uh, the first one, uh, uh, the uh, deeper layer would uh, take uh, the sensor inputs from an image, a pixel, and then uh, later layers would actually uh, not only uh, aggregate some of those inputs into uh, synthesized signals, but would also uh, uh, allow for uh, uh, use those uh, synthesized output as inputs for other subsequent layers. So, uh, and the idea here would be to uh, capture uh, out of a single image different feature maps that uh, would be able to uh, uh, synthesize uh, different uh, ways to look at the image and different kinds of information about the image. So uh, 
you could have uh, information, but for example, this is a, a very simplified view of the way, for example, the letter A could be recognized, but here, what we are trying to capture here are uh, uh, only parts of the A, and then some of those sub uh, separated parts of the A are then synthesized through, so through some kind of pooling of information uh, into, well, if I see these, these, and these, uh, those uh, three patterns here, uh, it means that that may be an A or something that looks like an A. So, and uh, the idea is that I've, as you go through layers, you uh, accumulate more information, more and more information what, what, what you have seen, while at the same time uh, uh, restricting uh, the uh, 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 the extent of your uh, uh, sensory uh, surface here. So that at the end, what you want, for example, if it's an A, you want a way to tell, well, is that an A or is that not an A? Or is that another letter? So, so uh, and the, what was called, so the, Neocognitron, so uh, was uses, using uh, this layer-wise uh, architecture for uh, the first half, and then uh, in order to perform the uh, uh, end task of uh, classifying uh, uh, um, uh, the uh, image uh, into its proper category, uh, it was simply used a linear classifier. But uh, everything that was happening before was not linear. It was clearly, clearly uh, 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 one step beyond what you had in the uh, perceptron. So for the next milestone, we should credit what can be uh, summarized as the School of Toronto. So uh, the University of Toronto has been uh, uh, the uh, uh, cradle of, uh, uh, I mean, m most of the uh, biggest innovations during the last 30 years. And uh, it started with uh, Jan LeCun and Josh uh, uh, Bengio, uh, who uh, were able to devise an efficient implementation of convolutional nets, uh, which dispenses with the uh, two-tier architecture that we had in uh, Fukushima. Uh, so, uh, and this uh, particular, this, uh, uh, this advance had itself been made possible by uh, the work of uh, Geoff Hinton, also at the University of Toronto, that had shown how to apply what we call backpropagation on multi-layer neural networks. So the problem of back, uh, that was back propagation was trying to solve was uh, something we need for supervised learning, which is when your networks give you uh, uh, a classification, well, this uh, letter is an A, or this letter is a B, how can you actually assign blame within the network uh, if your, uh, uh, how can you say that this part of the network uh, contributes uh, to this particular extent to the error we observed at the end of the network? So that's uh, what we're trying to solve. And computing this, uh, uh, this error would normally take a lot amount of time if you do that uh, algebraically. And the idea here was actually to uh, use a, a, a technique that we call dynamic programming in order and, uh, I mean, a very well-known uh, 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 technique to uh, uh, differentiate functions, which is the chain rule, uh, uh, which is uh, as old as calculus. And uh, in order to, and we, using the chain rule and dynamic programming, we could actually compute uh, this uh, uh, contribution of 
the different connections and different parameters in the network to the uh, ARR very efficiently. And this decreases the computational cost by uh, uh, an order of magnitude. So, so what did uh, LeCun, uh, Bengio, and Hinton come up with? Let's see. Uh, the breakthrough really happens uh, at the end of the 90s. Uh, why not before? Well, uh, as we said before, uh, uh, during the end of the 80s up to about that time, uh, those researchers were quietly working, but not with a lot of money, and, uh, but they were still able to do uh, to, to uh, gradually improve uh, an architecture that they call the LUNET. And uh, uh, the first few iterations of LUNET were really uh, were not really uh, hits, uh, but uh, with LUNET 5, really, uh, we have a breakthrough. Uh, it's a six-layer convolutional neural network that recognize gray digits. So it's the uh, MNIST test data. Uh, so it's a, a database of handwritten characters uh, that have been augmented with distortions and translations. And uh, this work uh, has been uh, influential on the longer run we'll see that uh, it's been, there will be some time before uh, this article uh, becomes, I mean, widely uh, influential, but uh, already by the late 90s, 10% uh, of the US checks uh, were uh, read uh, by uh, conventional nets, more or less based on the net. So, uh, And since then, uh, LUNET uh, has been, I mean, discovered or rediscovered by a, a, a number of uh, AI uh, practitioners who uh, were able to recognize in uh, LeCun's work uh, uh, really the foundations of what will happen afterwards. So, now, let's have a quick look at uh, uh, LUNET's architecture. So the idea was to have a, a deep uh, layering of uh, convolution steps. The idea is that uh, you would extract local features ac across all regions of the input. Uh, and uh, weights and parameters are shared for every one of the convolution map, the feature maps that you would extract from a single image. And the idea here that uh, out of a single image, you would actually extract uh, uh, feature maps that would each capture something different in the image, but over the entire image. Uh, then the second step would be uh, the subsampling, where we would actually reduce the resolution. And uh, the idea that, uh, for example, instead of uh, talking about uh, having a 28 by 28 uh, pixel feature map, we would now talk about uh, a 10 by 10 feature map. And this mimics what we've said about uh, uh, the first two layer architecture, uh, where uh, the uh, outer layer of the network uh, are smaller, but they are also much deeper. So, and at the very end, you've got what we call a fully connected layer where you're flattening your signal and what you want out of it is simply a, a way to classify your signals and to uh, uh, put uh, the image in the right category. So, now, Supervised convolutional nets uh, prove to be versatile. Uh, they have been lending themselves to a wide range of applications. Uh, however, uh, their uh, sheer performance uh, 
uh, does not place them at that time in a category of their own. Uh, Lonet is influential, certainly, uh, but the model leaves room for competing approaches, and uh, the model is also versatile enough uh, to be combined with feature extraction techniques. And uh, Lonet does not start either uh, an explosive growth in neural networks for computer vision. We see that training is still extremely costly and the computing power is lacking. So, for those reasons, I think it's good to have a, a glimpse of what the C computer vision toolbox is uh, uh, during the uh, uh, early 2000s. There is a long time challenger to uh, neural networks which are uh, the support vector machines. So the idea here is to go uh, beyond uh, 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 straightforward linear classifications. And uh, the idea was, would be actually to uh, 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 project your uh, input signals into a larger vector space and use an hyperplane in order to uh, separate between regions. So it's, it, was, it, it was and still is a very efficient solution for separating uh, non-linearly uh, some, uh, some, uh, some data points. Uh, uh, and uh, I would say that uh, until the end of the 2000s, uh, SVMs uh, had uh, performances that were really uh, still competing with neural networks. And, uh, uh, and also, if you're interested in uh, uh, beefing up a, a bit about uh, your uh, uh, machine learning uh, foundations, uh, learning uh, what's behind the SVM might be a good introduction uh, before you uh, dive more deeply in uh, neural networks. So Now, uh, uh, let's uh, keep looking at all those uh, techniques uh, that do not use connectionist architectures but are mostly trying to extract explicit features from the image. The idea here is uh, has relatively deep roots in what we could call uh, knowledge-based AI. The idea is that uh, uh, let's reconstruct some knowledge about the image, starting from features that we can describe. Uh, an example of it, for example, are uh, histograms of gradient descent uh, by uh, Dallal and Trix in 2005, where uh, you would actually uh, compute differences between uh, uh, very small parts of your image. You would compute so gradients, so going from uh, black to white, or black to gray, or more gray to less gray. And then you would then uh, use that information uh, to infer some orientation, uh, some kind of a, uh, uh, small vectors in your image. And uh, uh, then through normalization, uh, you would uh, collect some uh, uh, statistical data over uh, each uh, sub-region of the image and then ultimately you will use a linear classification to uh, 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 assign uh, an image to its proper category. So, uh, Another example among many others, uh, video Google. Uh, so uh, from 2003 uh, the idea here is that uh, you will use a, a kind of a, uh, an, an approach to object matching in videos that will mimic what you would do with text retrieval. And uh, you will try to find uh, viewpoints in variant regions, so regions in the image that really do not depend on where, uh, at least in some extent, to where uh, uh, the uh, picture has been taken from. Then you would try to find a visual world, kind of a, 
uh, elementary units, uh, uh, elementary visual information into, uh, into your image. You will index that and then uh, do some uh, 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 scene matching uh, using those bags of visual walls. So, um, uh, but as you see, we are still uh, in an uh, explicit uh, extraction of features out of our image. So there are well-defined steps, uh, algorithms that usually uh, uh, involves uh, uh, a number of different uh, stages and that are some, somehow chained together. So, uh, Another example, SIFT, uh, signal processing approach. Uh, the idea is would be, here would be to extract features out of an image uh, that would be uh, uh, using the technique that would be uh, robust uh, with respect to uh, change in scale. So uh, it used some convolution, so the idea that uh, you're going over each pixel of your image and uh, uh, computing some information on a very small scale, the, on a very small uh, extent uh, centered on each pixel. And uh, followed by, uh, in this case, that would be correspond to uh, some kind of a blurring of your image. And then you're making your, uh, uh, taking the difference of those convoluted images and uh, that we'll use later to uh, match and index features. And ultimately, uh, you will do some clustering, uh, another uh, well-known, uh, I mean, uh, well-known uh, uh, subfield of uh, machine learning in order to uh, uh, classify your features in your image. So now, Let's summarize this uh, first decade of the uh, 21st century. Uh, convolutional nets uh, excel already in uh, useful but relatively uh, well-defined applications. Uh, OCR, mostly uh, OCR uh, on uh, printed characters and printed material or what you could call also easy and writing, uh, uh, where uh, there exist large data sets uh, that of uh, uh, labeled samples. And uh, AI is not yet uh, front page material in newspapers. Uh, uh, however, it's quietly at work everywhere. Uh, uh, Google can detect license plates uh, uh, and faces in Street View images. Uh, well, faces, uh, li uh, license plates and faces uh, needed to be blurred uh, after uh, collecting the pictures. So that's what was uh, really a need for Google. And uh, but. Uh, Airports uh, had been using that uh, for uh, video surveillance systems. And uh, the, uh, there are also significant advances that happened mostly in academia during that decade that will pave the way uh, for the later boom. So let's have a look at those uh, uh, advances on the theoretical um, uh, side of AI. Um, recurrent neural networks, also called RNNs, uh, are not a new thing uh, in that decade. So the intuition uh, by uh, Rommel Hart uh, dates back to uh, 86. And the idea is that uh, if you uh, can have uh, layers of connection that are uh, stacked upon each other. Uh, you could also think uh, of uh, a, a single layer that would simply uh, take its output as an input for the next stage. Basically, you would roll, uh, 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 say, 
10, 12, uh, as many layers as you want into a, a single machine that would uh, uh, eat uh, its uh, own output. So, uh, feed on its own output. Um, so, and the idea of the recur uh, recurrent neural network was that uh, each stage would have actually two kinds of input. It would have the input of the previous stage plus the uh, uh, particular point or uh, 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 moment in time uh, 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 in the source input. So uh, this particular uh, frame in an image or this particular uh, 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 moment in a, a speech. And what actually this architecture allows that uh, 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 separate layers did not allow is that actually you can have as many layers as you want and you can now process uh, inputs that are arbitrary long. You can actually work on sequences. So uh, recurrent net neural networks will be applied first to uh, speech but uh, of course then uh, also to text but uh, you can also apply them to images. So now, uh, they have an issue. Uh, the problem is that as we go along, uh, uh, your network is uh, losing its memory. The idea is that uh, uh, it's hard, at the, especially on longer sequences, it's hard for the last stage to uh, get any meaningful information from what happened at the beginning. So, and uh, uh, that's what we call um, uh, the vanishing gradient problem. So, and the idea was, it was actually very hard actually uh, after, uh, during the uh, uh, iterations uh, uh, of uh, the learning stage, at some point it was very hard to uh, uh, assign blame uh, correctly to all uh, different uh, parameters in the, um, in the networks. So that problem was uh, largely solved uh, at the end of the 90s uh, by uh, what we call uh, long short term memory. So it was the work of uh, uh, Schmidt Huber and uh, using uh, long short term memory networks, uh, uh, the University of Munich uh, wins convincingly uh, uh, um, uh, OCR uh, competition. And uh, what uh, had been so far uh, uh, a narrow race uh, between uh, uh, neural networks and uh, hidden Markov models becomes from that point on uh, really uh, uh, a showcase for uh, long short term memory networks. So um, uh, my colleague uh, Angelos will talk more about what long short term memory networks uh, uh, brings to the equation here. Uh, but the idea is that basically each stage has its own memory, and, uh, but it also uh, it has a state that can maintain uh, uh, during the entire life cycle of the network. So uh, somehow working as a, a small computer that will uh, be able to keep its own piece of information uh, throughout uh, the time. So. Um, and it's interesting to see that in that part, uh, from uh, now on, uh, most uh, uh, OCR systems uh, are end-to-end -end system which do not rely on character segmentation. So they process they process um, uh, uh, lines uh, as uh, in a holistic way uh, without uh, trying to assign. Uh, uh, a particular position to each character. So now let's look at uh, what 
at, uh, sorry. Now let's look at uh, the two main factors for what we could call the AI renaissance. I'm talking what has happened the last uh, 10 to 12 years. Um, the first factor is, I mean, is the fuel uh, data. So uh, storage costs uh, plummet uh, during that, uh, have been plummeting during the last decade, allowing for larger, ever larger trading data sets. So to give you a, a, a rough idea, uh, um, I, uh, my colleague Sarah will tell you more about uh, those images data sets and what they involve, uh, but they're basically used as uh, benchmarks for all the progress that has been made with those networks during the last 20 years. But for example, at the end of the 90s, the MINS uh, data set uh, that was used by Lacoon for uh, Lenet had 60,000 training images uh, and uh, 10,000 testing images, uh, all grayscale. Um, a bit less than uh, 10 years after that, uh, uh, you had a uh, 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 controversial data sets, I will say a few words about that afterwards, which was called the uh, 80 million tiny image data set that had, uh, well, as we said, 80 million images um, and 32 by 32 image, uh, pixels. And then if you look at what has been widely used uh, in the uh, early decade of the 2000s, uh, uh, Pascal VOC uh, used uh, annotated images, only uh, 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 eleven, uh, sorry, only eleven thousand of them. Uh, but uh, it's dwarfed by uh, ImageNet that has uh, fourteen million images. Uh, not grayscale, but in this case, uh, three-channel images. So, now, uh, the second uh, factor for the AI renaissance is the engine, the computing power. So, and let's have a look back at uh, the plot I showed you uh, at, uh, in my introduction. So, uh, and we see that uh, from 2010, a bit after 2010 up to now, we've got uh, really a, a kind of a, a breakthrough. We've got a, a big change happening here in the amount of computing resources used by AI models. So, and uh, uh, what has changed here uh, is actually uh, the... Uh, uh, the falling prices of the uh, general purpose uh, graphical computing unit GPUs. So, and uh, if you look, for example, at this plot, uh, that plots uh, the price of the computing power with respect to performance we see here, that in spite of fluctuations that are uh, that typically reflects, I mean, the introduction of new products uh, followed by their uh, widespread adoption and so on. But you see that the trend here is uh, towards a really uh, 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 rapidly falling prices for uh, uh, the same uh, computing power uh, and data and uh, cheap computing power. Those are uh, the two factors that allow uh, for the uh, AI renaissance. Uh, and AlexNet, and uh, you remember because I've used AlexNet as a counterpart to the perceptron at the beginning of this presentation, uh, AlexNet actually illustrates uh, uh, how uh, those uh, two uh, main contributors to AI were able to revolutionize uh, the field, uh, not really uh, 
reinvent, uh, they did not reinvent or contribute to a, um, a theoretical reinvention of the field, but they allowed uh, what had been so far uh, a mostly uh, academical endeavor to become something that is uh, widely used by uh, any one of us, even if we are not even aware of it sometimes. So, if you compare, I mean, this is just a, a visual suggestion, so, of the difference between uh, Lonet and AlexNet, but in Lonet we've got uh, 2000, uh, uh, 220,000 connections, we've got uh, 600 millions of them in AlexNet. So, uh, and this would certainly not have been possible uh, without uh, the uh, uh, new uh, resources in computing powers, uh, 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 computing power available at the time. Uh, for yeah, the short story, I mean, uh, Alex Net's authors actually uh, had to divide to split their networks into two parts, which what is suggested here uh, in this. Uh, uh, in their article in order to precisely have all the power they needed. So they had to parallelize uh, some of the connections. So, so that would not be necessary today. So, so uh, I, I, I said that there was uh, no really uh, no theoretical reinvention of networks, but still, uh, a number of innovations appeared in AlexNet uh, that allowed them to be uh, uh, to become uh, significantly better at their uh, job. So, new activation functions uh, at the end of the networks uh, would allow for large gain in training time. Uh, what we call uh, the rectified uh, linear unit. Uh, uh, the a normalization layer would reduce uh, a, a common problem with machine learning, which what we call overfitting. The fact that uh, your network will learn your uh, training images so well that actually that's the only thing it will do well. And when uh, then tested on unknown images, uh, uh, it will have uh, trouble uh, doing as well as on the training set. So that's what we call overfitting. Uh, a dropout layer. So the idea here is that uh, you can have a probabilistic uh, zeroing of a neuron in, neuron's input. So same idea here. You don't want sometimes to capture too much information. Uh, otherwise, uh, you risk uh, overfitting your model. And uh, training data, uh, the training data was, was augmented, augmented by artificial translations and variations of the existing samples. Uh, however, that had already been quite of a standard practice at the time, if you remember Le Kuhn, so. What's the trend of the last decade? So for image classifications, you see that uh, the error rates have been decreasing significantly. It's kind of an arm race where uh, every two years uh, records are shattered. So note uh, that um, just because neural networks are becoming uh, significantly better uh, every year does not mean that they're growing in size and we've got uh, recently a trend in uh, uh, smaller networks smaller but deeper so that's the old idea so so uh, not as many parameters uh, and but uh, deep uh, is uh, the important uh, notion here so and uh, so what has been illustrated by ResNet or DenseNet, so which have become now standards model that are typically used uh, in uh, or available in many uh, AI frameworks. Speaking of frameworks, uh, a short overview for us practitioners. 
uh, we, uh, it's a kind of a, uh, my attempt at summarizing uh, uh, what has happened since the two early 2000s. So what we see here, th there is a, a kind of a, a C, C++ layer at the bottom. So, uh, and uh, uh, OpenCV, for example, was a, a way, uh, was a, a library that would actually uh, provide with uh, people with a large uh, number of uh, functions to work with images or transform images uh, without having to re reinvent the wheel. So it was a C, C++ library. Uh, uh, Torch Vision. Uh, was uh, initially developed in C plus a scripting language that is called Lua and uh, Storage Vision has survived uh, until now because it's, that's a, a, a popular uh, addition uh, to uh, a PyTorch uh, framework. Uh, and we had also VLFeet uh, that uh, typically was associate uh, C and uh, uh, mathematical uh, language called uh, MATLAB. And uh, this survives today in CAFE, in C++, and, uh, and also in uh, MATCOVNET. But uh, uh, this uh, lower level here has been, uh, uh, as we'll see, uh, uh, not not abandoned, but it's now much much less used uh, and not as well maintained as what has grown out of uh, scripting scripting languages in the early 2000s. Interestingly, uh, when Lecun had no money uh, for his projects during the second AI winter, uh, he would actually. Uh, uh, fight against boredom by uh, building in uh, Lisp, which is a function of languages that uh, uh, made the heydays of uh, the expert system in the 80s. Uh, Lecun would actually uh, build with Lisp a scripting languages for uh, working with neural networks. It was called Lush. So, and. Uh, uh, and this idea of uh, scripting uh, networks uh, was also present in uh, Theano that was uh, using Python. And we could actually uh, see both uh, Theano with Python, Python and the Lush idea, the scripting idea, as both ancestors of two well-known frameworks now for working uh, for uh, AI practitioners, which is TensorFlow, uh, which is uh, a, a Google thing, and uh, a PyTorch, obviously. And PyTorch, uh, has, uh, PyTorch popularity has exploded in the last 10 years. Uh, there is a reason for that, is that uh, NVIDIA, so uh, the uh, uh, maker of uh, the GPU, uh, uh, made uh, uh, available its uh, 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 its CUDA uh, library uh, for PyTorch PyTorch first. So uh, so uh, <coughs> just to give you a, a very rapid orientation in what uh, you have today, uh, there is a kind of a, a, a difference in flavor between the two frameworks. So. TensorFlow is easier, easier to uh, start with uh, because uh, it allows you to rapidly build uh, models and or to rapidly uh, reproduce uh, existing architectures, uh, while PyTorch allows you more tinkering. So the granularity of uh, the PyTorch framework uh, makes it a better fit if you want really to fine-tune your architecture. So it's not as easy to do so in TensorFlow. Uh, now, kind of a, I mean, a concluding consideration. So, is there trouble in paradise? Uh, so, clearly, uh, AI applied to computer vision had 
many benefits. For example, I mean, there is something that cannot, it's hardly controversial, which is the use of AI in image classification uh, in medical imagery. Now, uh, computer vision is significantly better at identifying uh, uh, cancerous spots uh, in uh, X-rays uh, than humans. So, uh, uh, but uh, there are, uh, besides that, uh, a number of uh, 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 really uh, big concerns. So. Uh, my uh, colleague Sarah will talk more at length uh, about uh, the bias that is involved in some data sets. Uh, I've said a few words about uh, the uh, 80 million tiny images, uh, saying that it was controversial. And yes, because uh, it was uh, those images were annotated. So uh, with, that means basically uh, uh, pairs of images and uh, annotation that would serve for training purpose. And some of those annotations clearly uh, were uh, showing uh, race and gender bias uh, that uh, I, I won't give you an example because that was sometimes particularly shocking. And uh, uh, it has been retired by the, the authors themselves in 2020. So, so uh, if you want to know more about it, you can go to Wikipedia so to to look it up. So, and of course, with uh, generative adversarial networks uh, that have been uh, the craze recently, we are talking now about uh, uh, appropriation of protected contents, about. Uh, 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 fake, uh, deep fakes uh, that uh, really uh, have uh, social and uh, political uh, uh, consequences that are serious. So clearly, uh, in faced uh, with all those concerns, I think it's good to uh, to 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 give to keep a sense of perspective and uh, to. Uh, uh, use our knowledge of the uh, computer vision history to be uh, critical enough so that uh, we do not um, uh, use those techniques in a naive way. So, thank you very much.